Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Ms. Supriya Dabir Gautam will defend her academic thesis entitled High Resolution Retinal Imaging. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis in the next 15 minutes. I'd like to give you the word. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Honorable Prorector, esteemed Defense Committee members, my colleagues, my dear family and friends, it's an honor and a privilege to stand before you today to defend my thesis on high resolution retinal imaging. I would like to begin with a brief introduction to the anatomy of the eye. As the ray of light falls on the eye, it encounters a clear transparent structure called the cornea. The light then further bends and enters a pigmented structure called the iris. There's a center opening in the iris called the pupil. As the pupil dilates, more light can enter the eye and further um, aberrations can also occur. The light then falls on a clear transparent structure called the lens, which then bends the, lens, uh, the light by either lengthening or shortening. This causes the light to go and fall on the fovea, which is the center part of the retina and form the image. The eye is compared to a camera and the retina is the film of the camera on which the image falls. The retina is a neurovascular complex structure made of 10 layers and the light then travels as impulses along this, goes on to the optic nerve and along the optic nerve reaches the visual cortex in the brain to form the image like we see it. The first image of the retina was captured by a fundus camera in 1926. This was introduced by Carl Zeiss, and it gave a mere 20 degrees view of the retina. The new age of modern wide angle cameras can give almost 200 degrees view of the camera, which is almost 80% of the retina in a single capture. OCT, optical coherence tomography, is a non-contact imaging technique which generates cross-sectional images of the retina with high resolution. OCT is able to detect the retinal microstructures similar to in vivo histology. This is especially valuable in structures where the traditional microscopic tissue diagnosis by means of a biopsy is not available, such as the human eye. The human eye is not an optically perfect system and there are irregularities within the, uh, within the tear film, the cornea, the lens and the vitreous, making visualization of the retina very difficult. Lower order aberrations constitute the greatest proportion and, be, and can be corrected by these machines. Higher order aberrations limit the lateral resolution capability by causing considerable distortions to the retinal image as part of the light is transmitted through the marginal areas of the pupil away from the optical axis. As you can see the little boy here, my son, you can see the image on the left with the aberrations. You can't make out the uh, facial description. You can't see the Merry Christmas or the uh, the the, uh, the decorations on the Christmas tree. But once the aberrations are corrected, it's a perfect image. So adaptive optics was originally a component added to the astronomical telescopes to rectify the loss of resolution from atmospheric irregularities. This allowed imaging of, so this has been adopted by the ophthalmologist and imaging of the retina at cellular resolution, leading to revolutionary changes in our understanding of retinal diseases. The study of vasculature is critical to understanding retinal pathology better. This is where a dye is injected into the arm, reaches the eye, and a blue light by a camera is introduced into the, light, into the eye, causes certain changes, and a green line is emitted, which is captured by the uh, modern camera. 
this fluorescence, which is emission of light of a, a lower wavelength and um, what a higher wavelength comes out cause is called fluorescence. And this helps us visualize the retinal vessels better. Now imagine that the, the complication of that is basically we needed a dye to be induced. It's an invasive test. It can be time consuming. And in, a, uh, in an eye hospital, it can also sometimes cause complications such as an allergy to the drug. So you would always want something which is non-invasive. So imagine using an angiography without, the in, uh, without injecting the dye. So that's similar. So imagine using the blood, the flow of the blood, the red blood cells inside the uh, blood vessel moving and against a static tissue. So the principle of optical coherence tomography was using this motion contrast. So 70,000 scans are taken in the same point and the, uh, the amplitude variation or the phase variation between these various scans are then used as a signal changes to uh, form the OCT. This helps in displaying in vivo retinal vasculature in a depth resolved fashion where we get superficial, the deep plexus of the retina, the choriocapillaries and the choroid vasculature. So you, you get a segmented view, whereas the fundus fluorescein angiogra uh, angiography was just a two dimensional imaging. So my thesis involves both the neural evaluation of the retina by using the adaptive optics and the vascular evaluation by using the op optical coherence tomography angiography. So the research objectives was to study the neurovascular structure of the retina with high resolution imaging, establish a normative database, and to identify biomarkers to de determine progression of disease and the outcomes to various treatment. So I'm going to begin with the adaptive optics. We described the, dis the cone mosaic, the distribution of the cones at various um, eccentricities from the center of the fovea at one degree, two degree, and three degrees in the different quadrants, superior, inferior, temporal, and um, nasal. And we found the, a significant drop in the density as we moved away from the center of the fovea. We, then you, uh, this was an emetropic patients, that means without refractive errors. Then we further looked at myopic patients where the axial length was longer, and we found that the density dropped as we went further away from the fovea. Now, structure was evaluated. We compared it with function and saw that the structure function correlation, whether the higher the cone density was, whether it related to a, uh, increased retinal sensitivity. And this was evaluated by using a functional cold, a tool called the micropyrimetry. And we found that there was a drop in the sensitivity as you went further away from the fovea as the cone density decreased. Now, we looked at it in pathology and saw this is a normal patient. And you can see that in pathology, you can see the cone mosaic, the density was severely reduced. Now, this is especially useful when we're looking at normal therapeutic uh, treatment measures like stem cells or gene therapy. We're not going to really see a layer of the retina. We're just going to see an increase in some of the cells. So this is an early sensitive outcome measure. This was in a patient in whom we didn't know the pathology and helped us diagnose melanoma-associated retinopathy. The patient actually had a melanoma on the foot and an autoimmune response in the eye with which the cone count decreased. So it's a highly sensitive non-invasive imaging tool for early diagnosis or at a cellular level. And we can identify a, uh, individuals for new age therapies who can be targeted for treatment. Moving on to the optical coherence tomography, uh, the fundus fluorescein angiography showed us the dye. So what you see here is the leakage of the dye in the network. But uh, unfortunately, since we're not inducing the dye, you don't get leakage seen in the optical coherence tomography. So how do we assess an active lesion? There are certain characteristics like a lacy new, uh, network, which can be picked up on uh, and show us activity as compared to a dead tree appearance of the uh, network, which cannot be seen. Uh, this is a dead tree appearance. And uh, this is an inactive membrane. So if we move the slab accordingly to the uh, correct uh, area of involvement, we can see activity. Uh, we also looked at a patient in who, ha who had a central, retinally, a central retinal artery occlusion. You can see this white area where there's absolutely no blood flow. We did an op uh, OCT, so there's no blood flow seen. And once treatment was given, you can see the blood flow through these blood vessels. So there's also the advantage of repeatability. We can do it again and again uh, whenever we want in the clinic. Uh, we also looked at certain patients, who, diabetic macular edema patients, in whom we gave treatment. Bef uh, this is an evaluation of the, the scan before the treatment was given. You can see these cysts. And then post-treatment, you can see the cysts have resolved. So it helps us analyze the central foveal avascular zone. 
So it helps us identify vascular biomarkers for early diagnosis and management and personalize therapeutic interventions by monitoring its efficacy. What are the challenges that I faced? It's expensive. It's not available in routine practice in private clinics because it doesn't always translate into clinical um, management uh, regimens. It takes time to obtain, process, and analyze the images. And there's a lack of standardization in the software analysis till date. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I now hand the words back to the prorector. Thank you, Ms. Candidate, for your clear presentation. Uh, and it's, uh, we're going to start now officially the opposition. But first, I would like to ask uh, our online members if they could understand the candidate or was he too fast or was it correct? I see a finger there from Professor Fingerling. Professor Boone also said it's correct. Work perfect. Thank so you. that works well. We have six members in the Corona, so we're going to address a question to you. And I would like to give the first word to Professor Linden. He was the chairman of your assessment committee, and he is affiliated with our university in the Department of Translation and Neuroscience. And I'd like to give him the first word. Thank you. Dear candidate, thank you very much for this very clear and engaging presentation. I'd like to congratulate you both on the presentation and on your thesis and also your promotion team, of course, and especially on this long distance uh, collaboration, which um, I'm sure has been very beneficial to both sides and certainly has to me as a non-expert been beneficial reading about your technology. And I wanted to focus on chapter uh, nine because it is a study on a, a disease that uh, all of us as physicians encounter, diabetes. And uh, so the, I can relate to this uh, from uh, I did from a clinical point as well. So could you just, um, because uh, we do have, I think, I hope a little bit of time, could you just give a brief summary of what you did in this chapter nine, early visual functional outcomes and morphological responses to antivascular growth factor therapy in diabetic macular edema using optical coherence tomography and geography. This was a clinical study or clinical trial intervention, but you also used biomarkers. Thank you very much, uh, highly esteemed opponent, for your question. Um, yes, this was a study that we did in patients who had uh, diabetic macular edema, and uh, we gave them uh, three injections, consecutive injections of the anti-VEGF, uh, which is vascular endothelial growth factor injections in the eye, which is the standard of care for patients with diabetic macular edema. So uh, we looked at their, uh, as I mentioned, we, it's, uh, we are not able to do an angiogram, uh, fundus fluorescein angiogram, which is an invasive test in all these patients, because we would like to look at the ischemic areas of the macula to see the response to treatment. Uh, the treatment of choice is between an anti-VEGF and a steroid nowadays. So to see whether the patient is responding to an anti-VEGF or we need to switch to a steroid. So to see their responses uh, of the foveal avascular zone, it's been, an, uh, it's been a very good tool. And um, we found that after three injections, the, the cysts do disappear. So the uh, thickness of the on the OCT decreases and the foveal avascular zone does uh, uh, reduce in size. And the vascular and perfusion density do decrease after three injections. And I um, understand from your paper that also there was a, po a functional outcome, visual acuity improved. Yes. Um, and... Uh, understand three letters on the uh, on the lower rhythmic scale that you uh, use uh, um, of, of the angle of resolution. Is that clinically relevant? I mean, do, do patients notice that, that improvement? Absolutely. Um, so when we start treating patients with diabetic macular edema, uh, we always tell them that we're looking at stabilization of vision. You may or may not have visual improvement. Um, this was in the days when laser was being done as a treatment of choice. Now that we have anti-VEGFs, we do find improvement. So they've all had an average of three letter improvement. And uh, it helps them uh, in some patients, it does help them even with ambulatory movement if they want to cross the road or uh, walk around the house independently. So yes, it does translate into uh, visual improvement for them. And the um, the bio, so clinical clinical success clinical effect but the biomarkers how will they guide you in further treatment can you I mean do you want to improve the treatment further will you do more injections what's the clinical cause of these patients do they have do they need do they um, require continuous 
um, yes. in injections or? Yes, yeah, so that's the challenge in diabetic macular edema. We know it's a multifactorial uh, disease pathology. It also depends on the systemic status of diabetes, their sugar control, their uh, renal parameters. So it is not just three injections. It is um, invariably they do need lifelong treatment. So the num average number of injections in the first year, according to the DRCR net, which is the uh, a clinical uh, research network for diabetic retinopathy, you need an average of nine injections in the first year and it moves on to about eight, uh, seven to eight injections in the second year. So three injections is, um, is just the beginning. So uh, three injections gives us an average to see whether the patient is responding or we need to switch the drug uh, because VEGF is not the only pathway causing diabetic macular edema. It could be an inflammatory pathway. So we could switch to a steroid, long-acting steroid in these patients. So these biomarkers may help us decide whether we need to switch treatment or continue along the same path. Because uh, in India, we don't have a, um, a national health scheme for the patients. So it's invariably the patients paying for each injection. So uh, the, the one of the challenges we face is then unable to continue the injections more than uh, maybe five, six in the first year. And uh, we, we are not able to do it as as easily in the West, uh, where we have higher insurance schemes. Very clear. Uh, thank you. And and you mentioned cost just now. You mentioned cost also in relation to the uh, imaging that you do. So uh, probably the answer will be no to to my question. Now. But is there a place for um, optical imaging for early screening of people at people with diabetes at risk for diabetic retinopathy of different types? Or absolutely, absolutely. So it is a screening tool. We have found changes in the OCT angiography even before the patient has developed diabetic retinopathy. So in diabetics, you can see some dropout areas in the retina, which are seen in the preclinical stage. So maybe it will help us in follow-up. We can call them for a more frequent follow-up or ask them, send them back to the in intensivist and ask for a stricter monitoring of their systemic parameters. I mean, I, I know the Maastricht study here is is doing retinal imaging in people with um, diabetes. So hopefully there'll be knowledge from here coming out about the sort of clinical use of this uh, as well. I understand the um, perhaps one final question. You also mentioned in your discussion measures of neural activation, I think. So you looked at the vascular terror, vascular aspect, vascular physiology. You look at the uh, sensory cells of the retina. What do you mean by neural activation? Do, do, can you infer this from this optical coherence tomography or would you need another electrophysiological technique, for example? Um, so the adaptive optics is a tool in which we can pick up early changes. So uh, initially, the thought was that uh, diabetes was, uh, you know, loss of pericytes in the vascular um, uh, structures. But now we found out that with the adaptive optics, the parafoveal cone count, the neural cells actually do decrease in density before the vascular changes to begin. So, um, so it, it could be it, it could be the neural uh, component starting before the vascular component. So it does. Add to that knowledge too. It doesn't, it doesn't give you a direct act, uh, assay of function of sensory cells. It, it gives you a, a measure of yes. their density or their yes. presence. Yes, it's more structural. Yes. Sir. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, okay. I think um, that you've you know, uh, answered my questions to my full satisfaction. Thank you very much. I'll hand the word back to the prorector. Thank, thank you very much. much. Your position yes. will then be continued by Dr. Van Park. He was also a member of your assessment committee, and he is affiliated with the Department of Ophthalmology at the Amsterdam University Medical Science. And I would like to thank him that he came all the way from Amsterdam today, and or yesterday, and I hope he enjoys this thesis defense. Very well, thank you, Mr. Convector. Um, Dear candidate, I have to compliment you for a wonderful piece of work. You have uh, done a lot of studies, and reading your CV, I realized that you were already an ophthalmologist. And not only that, you were already a vitreoretinal surgeon, and you were an esteemed member of the Indian Ophthalmological Society, and perhaps even of the Ophthalmological Society worldwide. And still, you took up the challenge to perform this PhD study and perform all these studies, for which we have to thank, thank you. And I compliment you for the wonderful work that you delivered. Still, there are questions that we would like to have answered, of course. And one of the questions, and I take you to chapter eight on page 87, and 
on and we go to table one on page 92 and um, you correctly uh, do a correction of your your uh, measurements with the uh, OCTA for the signal strength because uh, in increased signal strength will increase also your observation your, your vessel density and your perfusion density will increase also so you're correct for that that's that's wonderful you say before the surgery at least uh, three out of ten uh, would be uh, have been should have been the the signal strength otherwise probably your measurements would be completely unreliable and after surgery it is uh, it should be at least five out of ten is that correct yes okay now i read in table um one that the uh, of the signal strength pre and post it is 3.9 pre and that's the mean is that correct yes that's yes. correct and 5.7 is the mean of the post yes. signal strength yes, that you sir. measure and then the plus or minus 2.3 that's the standard deviation yes sir Okay, well, if you have a standard deviation, let's say in the post measurements of 5.7, and the standard deviation is plus or minus two, then I wonder how many patients would have a standard signal strength of less than five, which is in contrast with your prerequisite signal strength of at least five. It's, it's a mean question. So don't, if you have an answer, it's great. If you don't have an answer, I, I accept this. Thank you for the question, esteemed opponent. Um, so yes, I think there has been an outlier. Uh, so we also looked at the, the image quality um, of, of the image, and hence that must have given rise to the standard uh, deviation there. OK. Now, you measured uh, four weeks following surgery. Yes. That's very early in the period post-surgery, because then all kinds of processes are still active in the eye and probably also in the, in the macular area. And is that perhaps the reason why you find the things that you found in your study? So we, we had to adopt a protocol uh, which fell in line with the patient's visits in the clinic. It is um, a, a routine patient who undergoes cataract surgery and once surgery gets over and they're comfortable, they don't really come back for a follow-up. So four weeks is when we, uh, they come for the last follow-up in the clinic, in the cataract OPD, and we give them their refractive correction, if any. So that's the reason we did follow that. And we found that if there is any pseudophagic um, cystoid macular edema that does occur by then, um, then it, it's usually picked up by the fourth week, four to six weeks. Yes, but still, I understand the reason why you did it at four weeks, but still at four weeks there, the, the, let's say the, the influences of the whole procedure are not completely gone. And right. that's the reason why I come to my next question. If you have OCTA, then you measure at two time points, more or less. And it's the change between those time points that gives you the change signal that you are looking for. Because if there's change, then it is, has to do with flow in the vessels. And if there's no change, which is the residual retina, then it doesn't give you any signal. So the change gives you the signal that you, are want, you want to measure. That's correct? Yes. Okay. Now, the time between uh, the first and the second observation, so to say, can be short or can be long. And, and, and both have uh, advantages and disadvantages. But still, if there is a very slow flow, then uh, the timing between those two time points, if it's too short, and it is relatively short, otherwise other, all kinds of movement artifacts will occur. If it's short, then you miss movement. Yes. So that's the reason why you don't see any flow for example, in microaneurysms. And it, you can also see no flow in capillaries that have a very low flow. Now, if, let's say, a minimal inflammation is still present at four weeks following cataract surgery, could that explain the increase in vessel density and perfusion density that you observe following cataract surgery? Yes, there would be a low, low lying inflammation in the eye post surgery. So that could also explain, but um, that was not uh, translated into macular edema for the patient. So we had to just keep a watch on that. 
ha, you say there's no macular edema, there's yes. not clinical observable cystoid macular yes. edema, that's correct. Yes. But and there none is, of the patients and develop thickness on the structural OCT either, increase in the thickness. There is so an increase in thickness. Sorry? There is an increase in thickness. Not uh, in the patients with, uh, I mean, all the patients improved, their perfusion and uh, vascular density improved, but there was no improvement in the, I mean, there was no change in the uh, thickness as in the, uh, there was no edema in these patients. There is no edema, edema, but there is an increase in thickness, and that's something that you also mentioned in your in your paper. But that's uh, and then you say uh, the title of your uh, chapter is uh, it ends with uh, the whole procedure done in an Indian population. And uh, do you think that the Indian population will differ in their response compared to other people in the world? Um, yes, there are certain ge uh, genetic factors. I mean, if, if our, our population does come in with um, a denser cataract, they don't really um, come in in the early phases of lenticular changes. So we wanted to see if a uh, you know, higher grade of nuclear sclerosis or a, uh, we have our population has more of diabetes, also diabetic retinopathy. So we wanted to see if uh, it, it increases or there are certain parameters that can be picked up where we, we would need to call them for a longer follow-up and not just till four months, uh, four weeks, sorry. Yes, yes, you end with the uh, uh, remark in your uh, chapter that um, you probably think that if, because if it's inflammation, and I think it's inflammation that is causing the increase in vessel density and perfusion density, what do you expect if, if I'm correct, what do you expect uh, if your period following surgery would be longer when you perform the OCTA not four weeks later, but three or four months later? I think it would normalize by then in most patients, but there may be some who've had a higher uh, increase, who have had higher immediate post-operative inflammation. They would probably take a little longer time to decrease, or they may go into uh, cystoid macular edema either way. So they are the ones that we may need to probably follow up for a longer time. Okay, I agree. Is there still some room for a question or is... Unfortunately, your time is over. Yes, I've used all my time, so sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank and you I give very the much, word sir. back to the, to the director. Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Cohn. He was also a member of your assessment committee and he's affiliated with the Department of Vascular Medicine at our university, and I'd like to give him the word. Thank you, Mr. Proctor. <clears throat> Dear candidate, um, I want to congratulate you first with the beautiful thesis, nice thesis you wrote. I read it with great interest. Um, and I want to extend my congratulations to the promotion team. Uh, and uh, I see you did uh, a great achievement. Um, I also want to discuss with you some issues uh, on chapter nine, which is the, uh, the study with anti-VEGF in non-proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy patients. Uh, you did, and as we've heard already, you found a significant reduction in uh, central macula edema uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this study uh, with uh, better visual acuity in those, in, the, in those patients, probably due to less edema. Um, first, the question concerning the inclusion of patients. Uh, you stated that you included treatment-naive patients, but what is that? Um, have you included uh, patients that have been treated in the past with laser coagulations? And if so, uh, do you think that would have changed your uh, uh, results? Thank you, uh, highly esteemed opponent, for your question and your kind words. Um, so yes, we had uh, 21 patients who were treatment naive. When I mean treatment naive, it's for diabetic macular edema. They were not treated with either laser or injections in the eye. There were three patients who were treated uh, earlier, but uh, there was an interval of three months uh, since when they were last treated for uh, diabetic macular edema. That was the washout period that we gave them. Okay, okay thank you. Um, and then, um... There is the difference. Uh, there is a different uh, form, or there are different forms of macular edema. You know, there's focal and diffuse. And I couldn't get out from uh, your uh, paragraph whether what kind of patients you included. Uh, um, 
do you have an idea what kind of patients you included were mostly uh, a patient with focal macular edema or diffuse forms of macular edema? So uh, we included patients um, on, based on their structural OCT, the amount of edema that they had, uh, more than 300 microns. Um, so focal and uh, diffuse macular edema is more of a clinical diagnosis, not a, a, a OCT-based diagnosis. And uh, uh, these are all patients who were eligible for um, anti-VEGF injections. That means it could be center involving diabetic macular edema. Okay, but... Um... Um, in my uh, idea, focal uh, edema uh, disappears and disappears on other uh, uh, locations. And would that have uh, involvement of the, the way you looked into these patients? So focal and diffuse. Um, so these, these are all patients who've had diffuse macular edema because focal would immediately go into the criteria of laser treatment. We would just treat them with laser. Okay. So they wouldn't come into the uh, group where an anti-VEGF injection would be needed. Okay, thanks. Um, and then another short question is on um, uh, um, um, the multifactoriality of, of macular edema. It's 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 uh, condition due to microvascular changes in the in the retina and um, um, in the whole retina, and you have measured only the superficial capillary uh, uh, plexus in this uh, study. Are you sure that um, this represents the abnormalities, all the abnormalities in macular edema sufficiently? In other words, why didn't you measure the intermediate or the deep plexus abnormalities? And um, uh, I think you can do it with OCT. And why didn't you look into that? So in patients who have diabetic macular edema, the deep capillary plexus invari invariably does get involved. And when there's, a, uh, there's large recalcitrant kind of edema, then the, uh, the plexus gets completely distorted and we're not able to really get the measurements correctly. Also the Zeiss machine that I have used for this uh, angiography, is doesn't have an automated software for the superficial capillary plex, uh, for the deep capillary plexus, sorry. So it would be something that we would need to work on with another group. Uh, and it's it, it would vary from one, uh, depending on this kind of software that you use, it would vary from one clinic to another. Whereas this is the automated software built in by the uh, Cirrus Angioplex. Hmm. Well, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's something uh, worthwhile to look into because when I look into other sides of complications of diabetes, the skin or something like that, and then there is a, um, and there are two different things in what you see in the eye, and that's capillary rarefaction, and here you see an increase in capillaries as it, it seems, um, and um, there is a, a, an issue with opening and closing of atrovenous uh, 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 shunts. And um, you seem not to um, uh, have uh, uh, looked into that uh, with, with, uh, concerning the results of your study. Yes, we did not look at the microaneurysms, uh, though we did look at the foveal avascular zone, its area, perimeter, and uh, the circumference. Um, so uh, with uh, diabetic macular edema that uh, we were looking at, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, it's multifactorial in the sense that VEGF is just not one of the parameters that mm -hmm. causes edema. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be any other uh, pathway that could uh, be used also, could, uh, could be involved in the uh, development of the macular edema. So we just looked at those in, in a small population and just for three months. So whether there would be changes at that early, I mean, it's it's a short study. It, it needs a longer follow-up to study the other uh, parameters also. But, but, but where I want to go to is that uh, you think it's odd that uh, the vessel density decreased uh, in your uh, results. Um, and um, in my mind, um, when there are complications due to diabetes in any other organ, there is a rarefaction of capillarity. So the decrease in vessel density you observe um, may be 
a normalization of the situation and you think that it may be an artifact or something well you wrote a lot of that uh, uh, in your uh, in your paragraph but uh, couldn't it be just a normalization of the uh, vasculature absolutely um, but three months is a short time and what i meant was the system did decrease after the treatment. So the capillaries were stretched out by the cysts and it could just be a mechanical rearrangement also. It was too early to say that it's just the response. It, it's an improvement in the uh, vascul vascularization and a decrease in the ischemia. Three months was a short period. We saw a change. One of the reasons could be mechanical uh, remodeling of the foveal A vascular zone. And the other reason is, of course, as you mentioned, sir, it could be an improvement in the perfusion also. Uh, the reason we, we were not sure about the improvement in perfusion is because we did the density, the vascular density and the perfusion density didn't really go hand in hand with the foveal A vascular zone. Mm -hmm. So we thought that maybe it's the autoregulation mechanism. So we don't have a baseline image of this patient before they developed any macular edema. We have it only once they develop the macular edema. So it could be an auto-regulatory mechanism. Mm -hmm. And then this could be the compensatory response of the uh, auto-regulation once the treatment is set in and the VEGF levels have come down. Thank you very much. Thank you for your answer. I'll give back the word to the proactive. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the audience, we have the next two oppositions will be online. And uh, we would, I would like to give the word to Professor Bone. He is affiliated with the Department of Ophthalmology from the Amsterdam UMC. And I would like to welcome him online, of course. I'd like to give you the word. Thank you. Um, dear candidates, I would also first like to start with congratulating you and your supervisors with this very nice PC thesis on advancing advanced new imaging techniques. And I think it is a wonderful Indian Dutch collaboration and also a heartwarming example of the global village that we have and still have as doctors, especially in times of an increasingly polarized world. And I would like to exchange thoughts with you on several aspects of your research topics, starting with um, my first question on Stelling 5, thesis 5. So can one of your paranymphs uh, please read it? New treatment uh, modalities in ophthalmology, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, uh, nano-targeted drug delivery device, and micro-pulse lasers require sensitive and accurate diagnostic and monitoring tools. Thank you. So um, coming back to you, uh, Dr. Labir, um, with regard to monitoring of disease progression and treatment effect in retinal dystrophies, so retinal, hereditary retinal degenerations, which monitoring tool would you think is the most sensitive and promising and why? Do you have any thoughts on that? Thinking about gene therapy, for instance, uh, gene therapy monitoring, monitoring of disease progression. Thank you very much, highly esteemed opponent, for the question. Uh, if I understand you correctly, it is um, which modality uh, is a good tool to monitor response? Is, is that what you're... Uh, yes, to monitor question? disease progression and also to assess um, response to treatments such as gene therapy, as you mentioned in your thesis. Yes, so the adaptive optics, the uh, the cone measurement, the parafoveal cone architecture, the spacing, um, the density does help us monitor uh, a response to treatment because, um, uh, for example, there has been treatment started for uh, certain groups of patients with retinitis uh, pigmentosa where they've been given the neurotrophic factors. And um, you do see that uh, as you follow up these patients with the adaptive optics, you see that the uh, loss of cones is decreased. So um, that, um, whereas if you do an ERG, a multifocal electroretinogram or uh, a full field ret electroretinogram, or you're doing a um, spectral domain o OCT, you may not see these subtle changes 
uh, immediately. So these subtle sensitive outcome measures can be seen on the adaptive optics, and hence it can be a tool in these um, in these newer therapeutic modalities. Because if we don't see changes on ERG or an OCT, we may assume that this treatment is not working, and hence we may even uh, not continue the injections. Yes, thank you. So uh, uh, a question um, 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 after that is, in your discussion, you describe these advantages of adaptive optics, but still it has been around for quite some years now, and it is still not commonplace to use it as a key outcome measure in clinical gene therapy trials, for instance. So why do you think that's the case? And what are the current disadvantages that might be the cause for this, uh, for this at present? And how can they maybe be overcome? I'm sorry, may I ask you to repeat the question? Yes, um, so adaptive optics uh, has advantages as you also discuss in the discussion, but it has been around for some years now, but still it is not uh, used very commonly in clinical gene therapy trials as an important outcome measure. Why do you think this is the case and what are the current disadvantages that limit its use for such clinical purposes? Uh, one of the main uh, things is the commercial. It's um, there are very few companies uh, from whom you ca you can get a commercially available adaptive optics. So in routine clinics, uh, which are not attached to uh, teaching institutes, uh, it is an expensive proposition. And uh, right now, it's still. Uh, very early on, as in we are not doing gene therapy or um, uh, any of these injections right in our routine clinical practice. So unless we're able to translate it into um, immediate clinical uh, treatment, that's no, the reason sorry. it's... Can I interrupt? So I'm talking about advanced clinics. So university clinics who are doing gene therapy, they also are not using adaptive optics in gene therapy trials yet. What are the disadvantages of adaptive optics at present? Uh, the disadvantages could be its uh, repeatability sometimes and uh, uh, cooperation with the patient, trying to get them to sit through the um, entire imaging process. And um, uh, each time you use a different uh, sampling uh, software to analyze it, the cone count could be different. Uh, using of the sampling size of the window could be different. Or it could be uh, the phase of phototransduction that the patient is in at that moment when the scan was taken, the cone segment lens could, could also vary. So uh, there are inherent uh, retinal changes which occur, which could uh, uh, cause a variation in the cone count also. And uh, as, as far as, in, as India is concerned, we have only two clinics which have the adaptive optics in the entire country. So for us, it's also a challenge of accessibility to these uh, machines too. Yes, thank you very much. Rector, do, you, do I still have time for a question? There is time for another question, yes. Yes. Well, then uh, thank you for that answer. I would like to go to chapter 10, where you indicate that new vascular AMD can be um, more, the activity can be more easily shown with OCTA as compared to structural OCT and that manual segmentation is often necessary, but uh, the superiority may depend quite a lot on your definition of disease activity. And are you not comparing apples and oranges if you say that disease activity in structural OCT depends on the presence of fluid, whereas in OCTA, it depends on the aspects of the um, neovascularization, so the branching capillaries. Is it not, is it not very different in terms of activity? And when, is, when do you consider uh, the disease to be clinically significantly active? So there, there are uh, forms of neovascular membranes which could be um, inactive for a certain period of time and then get active again. So they do recur. So this is to uh, keep an eye on in uh, membranes which are non-exudative. They're still subclinical, but they're still present in the eye. So these are patients who come into the criteria of treat and extend, where we maybe they come into the clinic every three months and you give them an injection irrespective of uh, the presence of fluid or not, if they have a, a existing membrane. But if you see a dead tree appearance uh, as in a completely inactive membrane, then you can probably uh, increase your interval of, uh, for the follow-up of the patient. Yes, thank you. I, pro I think they're probably complementary, right? Structural and OCT and OCTA. Thank you very much. And then I'm satisfied with your answers and I give the word back to the director. 
Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Vingeling. He is, he is involved in the Department of Ophthalmology. And now we move to Rotterdam. So we go to the Erasmus MC and I would like to give him the word, but also thanking him that he likes to join this morning. Professor Thank Vingeling. you very much, the candidates. Interesting papers and uh, congratulations to you and your collaborators uh, for this work. I, I I I read your your thesis and I I thought back. I think it is ten or fifteen years ago that I was for a few days in Chennai, and I, I visited your hospital at that time. We had some things to do there, and um, what I remember most, separate from the impressive hospital and the things you do there, uh, was the traffic between the airport and the hospital and i was very much impressed by the skills of the the taxi driver to to go along all these big wheels and motorcycles buses everything that was there that was in your beautiful country and city i, I would like to, to to ask you a few things about your thesis and i, I would like to start with um uh, chapter seven uh, with this interesting case of uh, central artery occlusion and and the uh, retinal uh, artery uh, still being there um first of all you you made um images uh a figure one shows an image uh of the fluorescein angiogram chapter seven page 84 and then you made images with the octa just before and after a paracentesis. And, and that's very interesting. Um, and I, I wondered, are these images taken on the same day? Like the angiogram, was it taken on the same day before the, the paracentesis or was it a different day? Yes, it was. Um... Thank you for your question, highly esteemed opponent. It was taken on the same day. Uh, we did the, um, this was in the early days when the, um, we still had a prototype of the OCT angiography machine in our clinic. And uh, so till then it was just the fundus fluorescein angiogram, which was the, uh, the standard of practice in a patient uh, to investigate in a patient with central retinal artery occlusion. So we first did the fundus fluorescein angiography, and then we were also curious now that we had the new machine, let's see how it looks on the OCT uh, angiography machine. So it was done uh, pre-paracentesis at the same time, the angiography as well as the initial OCT angiography. Okay, and and what I will think is interesting because you you do this seven days after the occlusion occurred. Was that meaningful? Do you think? Does it that so does we, it have any sense to do that a week after? Yeah. So we do give the patient a trial if they have good vision when they present uh, to the clinic, their initial presenting vision is uh, good. Then we do give them a trial of paracentesis um, as a routine of uh, anterior chamber paracentesis. Okay. So not later than uh, maybe seven days. This, this was a patient who, you know, because had uh, the patient had uh, decent vision, we did uh, do the uh, procedure. It is normally delayed, but yes, in this patient, we did do it. And, and and now you su suggest that the paracentesis works because the, you saw that the the uh, perfusion uh, came back uh, on OCTA. Um, uh, do you know how long it the perf the perfusion was better than before the paracentesis? Because there's a low pressure in the eye after the paracentesis, and of course the blood can flow more easily through the vessels. What do you think it would be after one hour when the pressure has come up again? Did you, did you perform another OCTA after one hour? Or would it be interesting to do that? Yes, we did perform it after the paracentesis, uh, about an hour or two after the paracentesis. So the one that you showed here is is after, I, I thought you, you showed the one that was directly after. Yes, sir. It was immediately after the paracentesis, not on a follow-up. And 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 what happened after two hours, as you said? 
So uh, the patient's perfusion remained the same after two hours. The, it was just the initial after the paracentesis that the perfusion increased and it remained the same after that. And, and the, the, the eye pressure uh, came up again. So it, is, it, it was not an, any more dependent on eye pressure. It wasn't dependent on eye pressure. So, so what does it say to you? So it could have been um, just a spasm of the blood vessels that uh, uh, improved uh, because the patient's intraocular pressure even before the paracentesis was within the normal range. And uh, so probably there was either a plaque which was uh, blocking it or a spasm and it improved after the reperfusion. Okay. Would, would, you, would you still recommend a paracentesis to try a paracentesis after a week of occlusion? Uh, yes, now that we have seen that there is at least um, anatomically, there is improvement, whether it translates into functional improvement for the patient in terms of vision, we don't know yet. But if it does improve the, uh, the blood flow, then yes, I would. Okay. Had you the impression, you know, we, I, I think you also made it a normal OCT of the retina at that time. And uh, you, you can see, you know, higher reflectivity of the retinal layers if there is ischemia in a central retinal artery occlusion. Um, and after a week, maybe you start to see normalizing things or thinning out of, of the retina. Is, was there anything there that you that it, that you decided to, to perform a paracentesis? Because I, I think it's quite late. I, I, I wouldn't do it. I, I, I would say, well, everything is already dead. Or have you other uh, clues that there might be still something there that could be improved? There, there was still hyper-reflectivity of the layers in, on the OCT. It was still uh, clinically, it still looked like an acute central retinal artery occlusion. And uh, there was no thinning of the layers. And hence, we, we went ahead. We took a clinical call to do the paracentesis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I would like to go to uh, chapter uh, 10. And there is also the proposition uh, for uh, uh, about chapter 10. And you, and you, was, you were telling me I, I don't want somebody, somebody to, to, uh, to uh, or we can do it, proposition four. <clears throat> uh, proposition four. Manual segmentation of optical coherence tomography angiography images is a prerequisite to detect choroidal neovascular membranes in eyes with age-related macular degeneration. Thesis. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, but this was based. This proposition was based on a certain technique. At this moment, uh, they used a certain machine with a certain software. And that software wasn't able to do it as you wanted to do it, to have it done. How, how do you think this will um, evaluate, uh, uh, develop in the future, like within five or 10 years? Are we still necessary to do this manually? Or? So hopefully um, automated um, tools should get better and should be able to um, pick up all um, the membrane uh, irrespective of how deep in the retina it is, there is. But um, there are certain anatomical changes in the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, if there is a, a huge PED, a pigment um, epithelial detachment, then we found that as we go deeper into the retina towards the choroid, the sub-RPE or the intra-PED uh, lesions, then we do need a manual segmentation. But hopefully it should get better along the way and we may not need a manual add-on to it. Thank you. So uh, I, I, I have a, uh, um, like a story of uh, one of our professors at Erasmus University. He was talking about artificial intelligence. And he said, um, all these things are, all, all the people that do this manually now won't be necessary anymore within 10 years. What do you say about that? We don't need yes, ophthalmologists sure. anymore to perform the diagnosis. What do you think about that within 10 years? 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's amazing for a country like India, where not everybody has access to ophthalmologists. And if uh, we have uh, artificial intelligence and we are able to get enough data for deep learning for these machines and they're able to detect, uh, uh, you know, at uh, smaller clinics by the technician itself and refer to an ophthalmologist only when treatment is required, uh, that would be the way to go in the future. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to give the word back to the director. Thank you very much. And the opposition will be continued by Professor van Zandvoort. He is affiliated with the Department of Advanced Optical Microscopy at our university. And I'm glad to give him the word. Thank you. Uh, dear candidate, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on your thesis. It's clearly a reflection of a lot of work, a lot of papers also. So my compliments for that. Um, and I also would like to compliment you for your very nice presentation, which was very clarifying and to the point. Um, of course, you. also congratulations to uh, the promotion team. Um, and I would like to start my questions with a disclaimer. I'm not an expert, I'm a physicist. So my questions will be mostly on chapter one and two, because for me, as a non-clinician, an eye is just a lens with a screen. So, um, and that I use in lectures actually to, to, to explain uh, physics and lenses. Um, my first question concerns already page eight, uh, where you say the um, adaptive optics can theoretically improve the resolution to two micrometers. Now, as a physicist, when you say theoretically, I immediately ask myself, what about practically? Because theoretically is not so interesting. Can you answer that question? Thank you for the very interesting question, dear highly esteemed opponent. Um, so practically also, it does uh, um, uh, help in resolution of cones. We're also able to uh, resolve less, uh, you know, structures smaller than two microns because ro rods are also picked up by adaptive optics. So when there is a cone loss or as we move a little further away from the center of the fovea, we are able to pick up rods also. So yes, it does. But my point is that resolution is something else than being able to pick up something. You can pick up something that is smaller, but still not see the details of that structure. And especially cones, for example, you, they have a cone-like structure, I presume. Uh, so I would say that you need a resolution that's better than these two micrometers if you look at structures or even distances between uh, cones and, and rods that are smaller than two micrometers. And that has to do with the um, uh, Nyquist criterion, that if you want to see something of two micrometers distance, you need to image with a resolution of one micrometer. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to believe you on your eyes that, that you can see them, but can you see them in detail? And is it enough to quantify? Um, yes, sir, we can see them in detail. Um, as in, uh, we do know that there are certain parameters like the reflectivity of the cones. So uh, we just assume that the ones who are brightly reflecting are the functional cones. So we may actually err on the downside, as in we may uh, not really count all the cones which are there. But uh, we, we have an approximate estimate because it's also been compared to histology. And uh, it, it does meet, the, the density does meet what has been seen in postpartum eyes when they have been seen under a microscope. But then my question is, in histology, you have a 2D scan of a very thin slice. And we know from all kinds of vascular imaging, et cetera, that you actually need to estimate numbers and, uh, and that kind of stuff in 3D uh, tissues because that can be different. And sometimes it varies with 50%. So um, if you compare it to histology, the question remains, are you sure that you see all the cones and all the rods? And that is relevant, not because I just want to know and I'm curious, but because these quantifications you use a lot in the pages after that. So is that validated not only with histology, but also in 3D microscopy? That's what you asked me for. And, um, and did you check that? 
So um, what we used was a flood illuminated uh, adaptive optics, um, but uh, it is possible in OCT adaptive optics or as a SLO based adaptive optics where you are able to combine um, the uh, resolution of the OCT and get better images. So yes, I would say those are a, uh, it's a preferred uh, technology to use. Yeah, because I think in OCT, the actual resolution is smaller than the micrometer. So that's what you write somewhere. Yes. At least set micron uh, resolution. Okay. Um, now, um, what I want to go to question to the next question on page twelve, um, where you mentioned that OCTA has a is a high resolution volumetric uh, method. Can you tell me what the resolution is? I think you mentioned it in your introductory talk, but. Page 12. Um, sorry. I, uh, you mentioned that there is a high resolution volumetric blood flow information. What do you mean with high resolution volumetric? Do you mean what is the resolution? Can uh, you give that value or? For the OCT angiography? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it, if it's a, a spectral domain OCT, then it's, um, uh, it's much. Uh, less as compared to a swept source OCT. Uh, a swept source OCT probably would be a, a better resolution uh, volumetric analysis right now. And uh, uh, it almost gives us, uh, I would say, uh, two, mic two to four microns. Good. Yeah, okay. And then a remark that puzzled me, and I see that remark a lot in the uh, thesis, a complex algorithm. And a little bit later on page, uh, 23, a program provided by the manufacturer. That worries me a little bit because I think this is exactly the reason why this kind of technique still has problems to find the clinic. Namely, and that's a question that was asked before, that it's so much dependent what you do on an algorithm that you have no insight in, that it makes it very difficult to compare results. And you actually see that when you look at the uh, figure on page uh, 23, number two, from that image, I saw beautiful images in your talk, but that image will be very difficult to quantify. And you can use artificial intelligence or whatever algorithm to do, and you will come with a result. But is it truth worthy? Can you give me some insights. I, don't, I won't ask you about the algorithm because that's not realistic, I think. No, that's true. There are certain... You can lead you. You have time to answer the question. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, there are different machines. Uh, like for example, the Angio view does use the split spectrum decorrelation algorithm. Then you have amplitude and phase difference, uh, con you know, signals which are used. So there can be some machines which use a difference in amplitude between the B scans and then uh, get the calculation. And there are some which use phase. So there are you. You cannot comp It's like comparing apples and oranges. Actually, you cannot compare the scans from one machine to the scans of another machine. So yes, as of now, unless um, maybe like electrophysiology, they formed an ICEF international standards for uh, uh, the ERG uh, reading that we get. Maybe along the line, we will get some international standards for OCT angiography across machines. So as of now, it is it is a big challenge. Thank you. Dear candidate, the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and more in particular, the way you have defended your thesis this morning. I request that you and your family and friends await the results of our deliberations and our return to this room. Thank you. Thank you very much.
dear Ms. Supriya Davia Gautam, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis, but also the way you have to defend it, your thesis this morning. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you officially the degree of doctor. Professor Weber is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I invite your supervisor now to take the floor further. Thank you. First, uh, the oath. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? What's your? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Supriya Dabir Gautam, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Supriya Dabir Gautam, it gives me great pleasure to address you first after achieving your doctoral degree. I had no idea how our cooperation would evolve when I received a request to be, as you call it, your guide for a PhD course. And although the journey took a little longer than you expected because of your and our critical minds, and of course, because of COVID, everything ended up all right. Today, again, you have proven not only to be a true and rightful member of the scientific community, but also that you are a representative of the young and bright Indian generation that makes your country proud. And not only your country, but also your loved ones, in particular, your husband, your son, with done a great achievement today <laughs> by staying cool for 45 minutes. I think he's reading your thesis, <laughs> if I see it like this. And your mother, of course, also present today. Thank you very much for joining the ceremony. Writing a thesis is teamwork, and it's much more appropriate that one of your co-supervisors, Jan Schouten and Dr. Berenschot, tell us now how they have experienced working together with you. Therefore, I now would like to give the word to Tos Berenschot as one of your daily guides in the PG track, and he has the opportunity to also address you. Dr. Dabir Gautam, dear Supriya, it's a privilege to be one of the first to congratulate you on your PhD. I say some words, to you as one of your supervisors and be uh, short, I will try to keep it uh, short. All of us that uh, read the thesis and were attended your defense uh, know and saw it's very well de deserved. However, the journey to get here was by no means as smooth as uh, your defense. On the contrary, it really has been like a roller coaster right uh, actually. Our collaboration goes way back uh, to March 2012, 2012, you heard the right, when you started your PhD research. After you met uh, Jan Schouten, 
at AVO, there was some initial email contact to, over the study plan, which was then discussed in detail during a short visit of you to Maastricht, uh, February 2013. It was then decided to look for macular devil and adaptive optics sits at uh, Nariana Natralia. You were one of the first clinics that had that sophisticated uh, setup. Since you had already some papers, the idea was speed up and finish in two years time max. Very optimistic uh, indeed. Time flew and although both Jan and yourself visited Arvo, May 2014, you did not need there but you did at Brussels airport when you were heading for a meeting in Rome, if I remember correctly. And during that time, we had many discussions on statistics, whether to use one or two eyes, but most of all on data handling and quality of the data, you had some rather strange results that were hard to understand and explain. And unfortunately, they still are hard to understand and not yet explained since uh, April, 2015, you left uh, Narania and Italia to move to Chennai, and thereafter it appeared impossible or very hard to get hold on or reanalyze these data. Uh, moving to a new hospital, starting a family takes time and a lot of energy, and it was not until February 2019 that we met in Bangalore and discussed how to finish your PhD trajectory and have a thesis in the end. We decided to start using Okta, the, uh, which you explained so well as yet another sophisticated retinal imaging method. And we discussed these from time to time onwards during bi-weekly Skype meetings, which I enjoyed a lot. All were published in highly ranked peer-reviewed international journals and added to your thesis. India, like all countries, was hit very hard by COVID it changed lives considerably for the last two years and also affected research. And it was only until January 22 this year that you were able to defend your thesis in person actually. But even when everyone was nearly three times vaccinated and this uh, vicious disease seemed to have faded somewhat in the background, it got you and your defense has to be postponed yet again booking flights, arranging visa, booking rooms, cancel flights, cancel rooms, having new visa. You have done it several times. But fortunately today, here we are all together, having seen an excellent explanation of your research and defense of your thesis. Dear Sophia, you started way back in 2012 and here you are now, May 22nd. Research takes time. But it takes a scientific mind and stamina to finish with a PhD status like yours, especially if you face difficulties with data like you did. Move from one clinic to another, move from one city to another, start a family, raise a son, have many clinical commitments as a virtual retinal surgeon, and COVID affecting society severely for two years, which makes your thesis in my mind all the more impressive. It's of course you you who came up, overcame all these difficulties, but it's fair to say with a lot of help and moral support from your husband, your parents and parents in law. Uh, I thank you is in order also from my side and I'm honored to have had the opportunity to meet your mother this uh, week. Your father would have loved to see you today. Unfortunately, he was one of the victims of COVID, but I'm sure he will be very proud wherever he may be. I'm almost done. But before I come to an end and have your son who will ramble this for a lifetime, I'm sure run and play again, just a few years. This is the end of a journey, but it also is the start of a new one. We have agreed to stay in touch and start new challenging research projects the upcoming years. And indeed, you are the right candidate for this. One of the heart, on the one hand, an ophthalmologist, highly passionate about your work and bringing in the best possible care for your patients. These are your own words. With an eye for questions and uncertainties that still exist from a medical and patient perspective. And on the other hand, having the knowledge and experience gained in the past 10 years to initiate research to answer these questions and solve these uncertainties. And of course, 
we will visit we will visit each other to discuss science but also to explore and enjoy other aspects that are worth investigating like culture and food and music both from india and the netherlands dear supriya it really has been a pleasure for professor webers jan Schouten, and myself to guide you and work with you over the past 10 years and i really look forward to many more to come i've said and to invite but to the proactor thank you very much and we'd like to give a little applause So, Dr. Gautam, I think it's, uh, it feels good to be officially called Dr. Gautam. I would like to also congratulate you on the basis on the board of deans of our university. In my congratulations, I would like to extend also to the promotion team who brought you in the last several years, as, as far as I understand now, with after this COVID period, you decided to do it after the uh, post period, post COVID period, and to be not online, but to be live. We discussed this. You're real, you're not, you're not a person after a screen. So I really would like to congratulate you. And my congratulations and thanks. I also would like to mention the family. I understand your, your husband is here, your son still behind his favorite iPhone or whatever it is, and your mother, of course, and I uh, would like to congratulate too. I also would like to thank the members of the Corona who uh, spent time this morning to, uh, to, to be here online or on site, preparing questions, having discussions with you. I also would like to congratulate again, Professor Wees and Professor Berenschot for the collaboration with India. We do have, uh, we do have a long standing collaboration with India, particularly with Bangalore, but you moved to Chennai and I'll make a little bridge also to Chennai. I, I've been in Chennai several times myself because um, we, uh, we have a Dutch connection with, uh, with Chennai. Elsevier, the, the major publisher in the Netherlands, have decided five years ago to do all, all facilities, bring over from Amsterdam to Chennai. So Elsevier, Chennai, and we have our annual editor, editor's meetings in Chennai. So I know Chennai quite well. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice place. It's not my place, but it's a nice place. Uh, it's a lot of people. I hope and I would like to thank you that you came today, that you did your THD thesis with us. And basically on that, I would like to say also thank for the audience. I'm going to close officially this meeting using my hammer, as you can see here. This meeting is closed and how are we going to proceed? I would like to say some logistic things. First of all, um, we're going to make some pictures here.